So in this talk, I will be discussing some properties um, of a system of interacting bosons in the gross pitayeski regime, which is a regime which is relevant for the description of bosons and condensate. And I'm very grateful for Mathieu that uh, yesterday nicely introduced the concept of bosons and condensation, um, which is occurring, which is uh, naively speaking, occurring where a large system of uh, interacting boson behaves as if a macroscopic number of particles occupies the same quantum state. This concept is made mathematically precise through the, um, using the concept of one particle reduced density matrix, gamma 1. Here I'm using a, a definition for with the, uh, normalization uh, of the gamma 1 equal to 1, and uh, we say that the system exhibits bosons and condensation whenever gamma 1 exhibits an eigenvalue of order 1. And the corresponding eigenfunction is then the condensate wave function. From a mathematical perspective, the challenges are um, providing uh, or understanding in which scaling regime or in which for which class of interaction, for which sides of the system, actually we can prove the occurrence of bosons and condensation, starting from the microscopic description. And also uh, provide a description of the equilibrium properties of such a system in those regime. Maybe verifying which uh, those uh, which are the heuristic theory on, on this, uh, this respect, uh, the heuristic theory for bosons and condensates, which are from the statical point of view, the theory of Bogolyubov of that I will introduce in a moment. Also, there are interesting questions from the point of view of the dynamics, understanding if condensation is preserved during the dynamics, uh, which is the effective evolution, which are fluctuations around this effective evolution, but I don't have time to uh, enter in this topic. So for today, we will stick on the statical properties of both Einstein and condensate. But a key feature uh, which uh, um, emerges both in the uh, context of statical and dynamical properties of both Einstein and condensate is that we expect uh, the um, Yes, the equilibrium and non-equilibrium properties of the system do not depend on the fine details of the interaction, which only enters uh, into the play through its scattering length. And from a mathematical point of view, we aim uh, to prove this universality result starting from a macroscopic description that, as we heard in Mathieu's le lecture, uh, is provided by this many-particle Hamiltonian acting on the subspace of L2 R3n of, of function which are symmetric under exchange of particles, bosons in fact. And you recognize here we have the one particle part of the Hamiltonian, the kinetic energy, the trapping potential, and the two-body interaction. And the scattering length is a parameter, effective parameter associated to this interaction, uh, which is defined as follows. Um, Take the zero energy scattering function for your potential with boundary condition that f goes to infinity, then the scattering length is proportional to the integral of the potential times the scattering function. And it's very easy to see what this means for short range potential because of course then we can solve the equation outside the range of the potential and this is uh, the expression of our scattering function and you see that A appears in asymptotic behavior at large distance. From a physical point of view, the scattering length, sorry, not scattering function, but the scattering length A is a sort of effective range of the interaction, namely two particles far apart, they see each other as they were hard sphere of radius A rather than the range of the potential. So it's an effective range of the interaction. Um, and uh, um, what we would like to, uh, what I would like to discuss today is how we can recover that the thermodynamic function of a bose einstein condensate only depends on the interaction through the scattering length in a particular scalar regime, which is the gross pitayeski regime that I'm going now to define. In this regime, we consider n bosons confined in a region of order one, uh, and uh, the potential now is rescaled in such a way 
Now you see that uh, the range of the potential is much, it's very small, it's n to the minus 1, much smaller than the typical distance among the particles, uh, which is n to the minus 1 third in this regime. And also, just using the scattering equation and rescaling, you see that the scattering length of this potential here is nothing but the scattering length of the original potential divided by n. So the peculiarity of this gross pitayevsky regime is that we have a range of interaction and the scattering length, which are in the same range, n to the minus 1, much smaller than the average distance. But intensity of the interaction is very strong. So we are really describing short range and intense interaction. And let me comment a bit more on this. So which are the typical interaction that we are describing in such a regime? Well, if you look, which is the probability of interaction with a given target particle, well, this is extremely small, it's n to the minus 2. But then the typical intensity of the interaction is very small, n to the 2. So this means that the force in this scaling, the force on a single particle coming from all the other is order 1. So this makes the contribution from the potential energy be of order n rather than n squared, as one uh, would guess in a, in a different scaling. OK, so this is the, the gross pitayevsky regime. And uh, um, I'm very grateful for the very peering result in this contest. So the first that one understood that this scaling, the gross pitayevsky regime, could indeed be a good approximation for uh, the, or a good provide a good description for the experiments in cold atoms that were done uh, the first experiment with bosons and condensation for cold atoms uh, in 95. Yeah, I believe we hope this to, uh, yeah, Lieb, Saring, and Himbason that realized that this regime could in fact be useful to understand or to describe bosons and condensate. And this is the appearing result in 2000. Take the our many body at Hamiltonian, then the ground state energy for particle in the limit L to infinity is just described by the minimizer of a one particle energy functional. And now you see that here the potential enters, in fact, only with its scattering length. And moreover, there is condensation for the ground state uh, uh, function, namely the one particle density matrix associated to it uh, converges in trace norm to the projector onto the minimizer on the gross pitayevsky energy function. And in fact, this result is even more general. It does not only hold for ground state, for, for any approximate minimizer. So any state who has the property that is energy for particle is converging to the ground state energy. And let me use this result to explain to you a striking property of this gross pitayevsky regime, which also contains all this of its difficulty, or many of these difficulty. The role of correlation, in fact. Uh, in fact, the result on the ground state energy that was obtained shows us very clearly that even though this system exhibits condensation, the ground state energy of the system exhibits on the condensation in L2 norm, is it not true that the many particle wave function is just the product of one particle function? And it's a very easy computation to see that because if we just compute the energy of a factorized state, well, you realize immediately that from the potential here, in the limit for large n, this behaves like a delta function. And so you get something which has the correct form that you expect for the ground state energy in the limit, the ground state energy for particle in the limit, but with a prefactor, which is the integral of the potential and not the scattering length, which is much smaller. Uh, and uh, the reason why uh, if you use a factorized state, we don't get the correct result. And that in fact, the many body wave function has a more complicated structure than being a factorized state. In particular, is two particle density matrix has this form. So this is the two particle density matrix. So it's not only the projection onto the condensate, but as this correlation structure appearing, this is the solution of the scattering equation for the new potential, the one, the gross pitayevsky potential. Well, now for n large, if you are just testing this against a nice function, well, f is going to 1. So in the limit, you really get the convergence to the gamma 2 that you expect. But when this is evaluated against the very singular gross pitayevsky potential, here is the where, where the f appears in front of the quartic interaction. Uh, 
So the role of correlation is very important in this Gospiaisky regime. Um, now let me, just for simplicity, because then the results that I'm going to present are a bit more easy to state, just consider, rather than the general trap, a box. A box of humid <coughs> volume, lambda, and then our Hamiltonian is the following. And I I'm considering it with periodic boundary condition. Um, what I want to, to, to tell you is that now, in fact, we have even more information on the statical properties of both gases. In fact, after 20 years, we are very happy that we could understand a little bit more. And in particular, we can prove that uh, uh, for any, okay, that the ground state energy is in fact given by this factor 4 pi a n with an error of order 1. And moreover, we have a precise bound on condensation, on the rate for condensation. So this 1 minus the expectation of gamma 1 over the condensed state, this is just the fraction of particle outside the condensate. So this guy here is the number of particles outside the condensate, and we can prove that in this Krasbitayevsky limit, this is bounded uniformly in n. This is exactly what one expects in a Bose Einstein, uh, um, in a perfect Bose Einstein condensate. That the, mm, a macroscopic number of particles goes into the condensate, and then you have only bounded number of particles outside the condensate. Uh, and here, phi w the condensate wave function is just one because we are into the box. So the minimizer of the gross pitayevsky function is just the constant wave function. And one can also understand a bit more what this constant here is, order one. And uh, uh, sorry, uh, very important. All that is, has been also extended to trap very recently. So I'm only presenting the result for the box, but everything can be also extended to the more general case of the trapping potential. So, and one can even a bit resolve better the low energy excitation spectrum. And so derive an expression for the ground state energy up to error terms, which are of smaller order with n. Um, and this expression here in orange is in fact what is predicted in the physical le literature to, to be appeared by this famous Bogolyubov theory. And one can also obtain information on the spectrum of excitation below low energy excitation. And once more you obtain that the excitation, so that the eigenvalues have this form. So we have the sum of the number of particles with momentum p and this dispersion relation, which is linear for small momenta. This uh, uh, being relating to the emergence of superfluidity in those system. And what I wanted to stress here is that in this gross regime, we obtain that the, all this quantity here and the spectrum of excitation depends on the scattering length. In fact, arriving, arriving to the proof of this result as a long story, starting uh, from a less singular regime where we learned a lot. And uh, um, the main novelty of the result is in fact this independence on the details of the potential that was not visible in previous less singular regime than the gross one. OK, um, uh, which are the ideas of the proof that I'm going to tell in a moment? The idea is really to provide a rigorous version of Bogolyubov approximation, of Bogolyubov theory. So I should maybe first tell what Bogolyubov theory is about and let me tell in words, then I'll be more precise with formulas. Um, the idea is that Bogolyubov assumes condensation. We know that there is, there is condensation for free bosons, as Mathieu showed. So let's assume that if the interaction is sufficiently small, this property is still preserved. And then expand around the condensate. So consider all the situation where all the particles interacting are in the condensate, there are two in the condensate and two outside, and so on. And then uh, um, neglect, the idea of Bogolyubov was, well, ne neglect the contribution coming from more than two excitations, just because there are very few excitation around. So I may expect that terms coming from three excitation and one particle in condensate or all excitation are much smaller, uh, as a very a smaller effect on my, on my system. Then I have something that I can treat because once I have neglected this contribution, I have really an explicit model that I, where I can compute everything. Well, surprise, I compute and I see that uh, the energy that comes out, the spectrum that comes do depend on the potential. But Bogolyubov knew very well the reason why this was the case. He had neglected a lot of terms, 
that maybe it was not allowed to neglect. But at the very end, he just realized that some of the expression in, in the expression for the energy, uh, there was like a serious expansion for the scattering length. A serious expansion where the scattering length, this is the so-called Born series for A, where you write uh, that uh, APA is just the integral of the potential plus errors that you can write explicitly that are order A over R naught. So if this is small, this is a reasonable expansion. But notice that in the regime we are considering, in this gross Pitayevsky regime, this is really order one. So for us, this expansion would not hold at all. This makes the gross Pitayevsky regime very complicated. But anyway, with this uh, consideration, Bokolubov managed to obtain back the scattering length appearing in the, in the ground set energy spectrum, and which is the, 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 the line of our proof. Well, first of all, we show, in fact, that condensation occurs in this gross Pitayevsky regime. So we have a priori energy bounds on the number of particles of excitation and on the energy of this excitation. Then, as in Bogolyubov theory, we expand around the condensate. But now we do not neglect this cubic and quartic term. We take into account the energy coming from these terms. And once we do this, we realize, uh, we, we, we obtain that our system can be expressed in, uh, once more in, a ter in terms of a quadratic Hamiltonian. But now this quadratic Hamiltonian has been renormalized. So now the coefficient of this Hamiltonian are not depending anymore on the potential, but only on the scattering length of the interaction. So in effect, the scattering length appears naturally in the result as an effect of this renormalization. And this was not absolutely our idea. In sense, in the physical <laughs> community, immediately after the work of Bobolyubov, there were several attempts of trying to do perturbation theory around the Bobolyubov model with the renormalization group technique of the same type that you have seen in Manfred direction yesterday, and try to figure out which were the relevant diagrams given this renormalization. In fact, they, they, they say that these diagrams are ladder diagrams, so very similar to those that Manfred described, even though in a different language here. But the point is that controlling the errors, so really showing that all the other diagrams you can throw out, this was not an easy task. And in fact, we can do it here just because in this gross Pitayevsky scaling, we have something that helps us, namely that, uh, um, that the parameter of our expansion, rho a cube. If you wonder why it's it, well, this is the parameter, in fact, um, appearing. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure that I can show here. Anyway, so the parameter that it's appearing uh, in, uh, in our expansion is of order n to the minus 2 in this cross Pitayevsky regime, because the scattering length uh, is very small. And this helps us in controlling the error terms. But the idea of uh, doing such a procedure was uh, this back already to the very uh, first work after Bogolyubov theory. OK, and which are the key aspects in our proof? Well, uh, ident identification of the relevant length scales, first of all, uh, or energy scales, according to how you see it. So the relevant length scale are the range of the potential, which is very small, and what is called the hailing length of the interaction, which is of order one. And then the, the, the idea of modeling this correlation, this correlation that you have seen already in the discussion uh, uh, that I made on the paper by Lieb, Seidinger, Ingvason, well, we model this correlation using some suitable operators. And then functional estimate. OK, so uh, if there are no questions so far, maybe I try to give an idea of really how you can reach these goals from a mathematical point of view. And to do so, I need to um, give you a very quick introduction of what is a, a representation which is very useful when we deal with many particle systems, which is the Fox space. The Fox space is just the space where you describe your quantum system when you want to, to deal with a grand canonical setting where the number of particles is not fixed. So just, just take this direct sum of all n particles, small n particle state. And this is the Fox space. 
So now a vector in the Fox space is just a collection of vectors with any possible, sorry, a collection of wave function with any possible number of particles. And now that you can uh, have several uh, number of, sorry, now that you can change the number of particles in your system, it's also convenient to introduce operators that do change this number of particles. And in particular, here I'm defining the creation and elation operator, um, a star p and np in this way. So a star p is just creating a wave function with momenta p, and then it's just symmetrized over all the particles because we are dealing with bosons. And the annihilation operator is just uh, integrating one out one variable against this uh, APX. And it's just a computation checking that this commutation and uh, annihilation operator satisfy this canonical commutation relation. Um, and now any operator in the Fox space can be very easily explained, uh, expressed in terms of this creation annihilation operator. Let me convince you of that. Well, first of all, the number of particle operator. If I want to count the number of particle in my system, we are on the torus, right? So I'm doing everything in the momentum space because we are in the torus. So we can use as a basis our plane weights and everything fine. So to each particle, we can associate its momentum. So if we want to count the number of particles, just sum over all momenta the number of particles with p. And this is just counting the number of particles, right? Because I first destroy a particle, then I create one. So I'm counting the number of particles. And very similarly, the Hamiltonian has this form. So here I'm just saying that to the number of I count the number of particles with momentum p, and I associate the energy p square. And the interaction can seem a bit more mysterious, but it's not. I'm just representing the interaction this way. I have two incoming particles, one with momentum p, one with momentum q. They interact. Let me represent this weakly line, just the interaction. And then we have two outcoming particles. We are creating two particles that now have momenta p plus r, q minus r. So this is just a way to represent our two-body interaction just as a scattering process involving two particles that are disappearing and two new particles that are appearing. And of course, there is momentum conservation in this process. OK, so this is the tool that we use. But here comes a very nice idea uh, of levin nam serfati solovey Why don't you use this Fox space rather than to describe the fact that particles can vary, just to describe the fact that excitation can vary? So let us consider a system where the number of particles fixed is capital N. But we know that excitation can go from 0 to capital N, in fact, so are not fixed. So just use this Fox space to describe excitation. Say it better, <laughs> take your n particle wave function and your condensate wave function. Then there is a unique decomposition of your many particle wave function in terms of, of with this factor. So you have you put all particle, you have a term where all particle are in the condensate and you have no excitation. Then n minus particle in the condensate, one excitation, and so on. And this decomposition exists and is unique if these alpha j's are j particle wave function which are orthogonal to the condensate in any variable. So this splitting here just defines a unitary map from your initial space of n particle to a Fox space here where now this alpha 0, alpha 1, so on, represent excitations. So here you're just saying, well, my many particle states is described by his excitations. So I'm removing, in a sense, the condensate wave function and just focusing on the excitation with respect to it. Um, so once more, if you now ask which is the number operator on this Fox space, or why I'm using this notation? Well, this is just the less uh, Equal capital N stands for the fact that here I cannot have more than capital N excitation, clearly. And the plus uh, is to recall ourselves that these alpha j are orthogonal to the condensate. In particular, this means that all moments are different from zero. OK, so now the number of particles in this Fox space, this just counts the number of particles outside the condensate. And in particular, if you take the factorized state, this is the state with zero excitation. OK. Uh, 
now let's take our Fox space Hamiltonian. This is just Hamiltonian written in the Fox space. And apply this map U. This map U um, factorize out the condensate. Um, in particular, the action of this map U is the following. Un is there P80, for example, uh, where I'm considering here P different from zero. So it just leave invariant particle with momenta different from zero and substitute particle in the condensate with, in fact, the number of particle of the condensate. Recall this is the number of excitation minus, yeah, of course, the contrary. <laughs> Total number of particle minus number of particle in the condensate. So, and this, this but you, you use this map. In fact, this is just a rigorous version of the, uh, the, the first step in Bogolubov uh, approximation. It allows you to focus on the condensate. And you extract from here several contributions. This one is the contribution that comes where all these operators act on uh, momentum zero. So you just get the integral of the potential. Then you have terms which are quadratic in this annihilation or creation operator, cubic and quartic. And now um, remember that Bogolubov approximation just corresponded to neglect this L3 and L4, but why now we want to keep track of them. And another remark is that notice if we now take this Hamiltonian on the vacuum, so on the state with no excitation, so this means that these terms here are just zero, well, we get again n times the integral of the potential. So the wrong answer, but we are no already know, right? Because the vacuum state was the factorized state that we also considered before. And we know that the factorized state is not a good approximation to the ground state of the system in this Rospitajewski regime. Okay. We need to take into account for the energy of correlation. This is the message. And now, how do we do to do this? Um, we use suitable unitary operators acting in this Fox space. So this is the Hamiltonian, just lift at the level of this excitation. So now it's became an, an Hamiltonian from this Fox space of excitation to a Fox space of excitation. And now we, conjug we conjugate this with suitable unitary operators. I will explain in a moment how these uh, operators are done, but just I want to, rem to, to stress the fact that the kernel here of this operator, this eta, is related to the scattering equation. It's just a modified version of the scattering equation because we don't want the scattering equation in the full space, we are on a box. So we should just consider the problem on the box. So that's why it's slightly modified with respect to the scattering equation you see before, but it, is the, it shares the same property. So take the scattering function and then build this eta that is 1 minus f multiplied by hand just to have something of order 1. So the eta, eta goes as 1 over x uh, for large x. So you see that this eta is 0 um, yeah, as long particles are not correlated anymore. OK, so the choice of the kernel is related to the scattering equation. And we need to put several operators, two operators, TNS, that I will discuss. But if you use these operators and look now at this new Hamiltonian that you just built in this way, well, it has very nice expression. I don't pretend you to follow all the details. In particular, here I've not defined yet this B operator. I will do in a moment, just think to that as creation annihilation, usual creation annihilation operator. But the point is that you don't see in this expression beside here the potential appearing any longer. Everywhere in the constant term, in the quadratic terms, in the cubic term, only the scattering length appears. So this is the renormalization I was referring to. And uh, the potential is not renormalized, but for our theorem, I didn't stress, sorry, so our theorem holds only for positive potential. So in fact, we are allowed to throw it for a lower bound. And uh, so we managed to write this new excitation Hamiltonian as this main part where only the scattering length appears beside for the positive interaction, plus an error terms, which is small and inbounded in terms of the other guy appearing. So in particular, with this, we can really prove that this excitation Hamiltonian is bounded from below by the ground set energy at leading order plus the number of excitation. So and from that, we, we can obtain the 
uniform bound on the bound of excitation that I was mentioning in my theorem. And I'm and I just wanted to show you how these operators are made. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah. so you have the term which is cubic. So it's, uh, I mean, it's B A star A. And you have also the scattering length there. Yeah, but in fact, because I introduced also this. OK, this but, but that would, in principle, not be necessary, right? No, it would ne be necessary to show condensation for large potential. So if you have a small potential, you can avoid this. So small potential, namely a small factor in front of the potential. But if you have large potential, you need also to renormalize the, this. Uh, this cubic term. Okay. Otherwise, you can. Otherwise, the only thing that you can prove is that this cubic term is bounded with some potential energy plus number of particles, but you don't have any small factor in front, so, so you cannot uh, absorb <laughs> the potential, and you will bound the term. It's not leaving order. No, okay. exactly, exactly. But in a previous version of the paper for small potential, we didn't uh, need to this renormalize this. So maybe yeah, that was. Okay. Um, and now let me uh, take some time to explain you how these unitary operators are done, because they have a very clear physical meaning. This is just what uh, I wanted to, to stress here. Uh, so first of all, I have to tell you what these B star operators are. So these B star operators are, in fact, if we look at their action back on the original L2N space, where it's more simple to see, these operator B star are just annihilating an excitation, uh, a condensed particle and creating an excitation. And then are renormalized, because we know that we have a lot of condensed particles. And similar to B is creating an excitation, is annihilating an excitation and creating a, uh, a condensate. So this B star operator takes into account process where you have a particle in the condensate that become excited or vice versa. So if you look at this first operator here, this with two B stars, well, this is just uh, describing a process where two particles in the condensate becomes excited or vice versa. So you have the scattering in this uh, picture that I have. I have the scattering between two particles with momentum zero that creates two excitation or vice versa. Two excitation with momentum P and P are annihilated and two particles with momentum zero uncreated. And uh, this is done with a kernel, which is this eta p, which is related to the scattering equation. And this cubic here is just the natural generalization of this, when one of the particles is no more in zero momenta, but this is a momenta v. So rather than having zero, zero p minus p, you have a v and p minus p. So just you are also considering this scattering of particle where you have one particle in the condensate, which is in this b, high hidden in this p, one particle with very low momenta, and two excitation with high momenta. So it's just a generalization of the first transformation that we, we have seen here. Um, and uh, I'm cheating a little bit because I'm not telling you uh, that we are also need to put some, uh, some cutoff in this exchange momenta. So we really have to de define which is high, part high energy particle and which are low energy particle. And high energy particle are particle with an energy around n. n is the inverse range of the potential. And low energy particle are energy which have an energy which is one over the inverse scaling length of the of the bosons and condensate is of order one. This Helling length is the length where the Helling length is the length where you see the change in the dispersion relation. So we, we saw that the spectrum of our uh, bosons and condensate had this form. So particle with momentum p have an energy e p p four plus sixteen p a p square. So the region, the Helling length is where the kinetic energy p square, uh, square is equal to this, uh, this linear part. So really this Helling length, this scale that defined the, uh, so one over rho uh, n, which is the 
L in length, and which defines the low momenta, is this one. So sorry, maybe I become a bit more precise. So in our momentum space, we have an element energy scale, which is n, inverse range of the potential. Here we have this uh, Helling length, length. And so for us, these are high momenta, and these are low momenta. And the low momenta are defined by the moment where, so here you have a quadratic dispersion relation, so bosons behave as free particles, while here bosons uh, behave so linearly in P. And let me also remind that here we are in this uh, finite box, so we have a gap. This makes uh, the, the gross pitayeski case simpler. Than the, so we don't have any infrared divergences, we only have to, to cure the ultraviolet divergence divergences in the language that Manfred was uh, using yesterday. So this was just a comment, supposed to be a comment for this remark, that the cutoff really uh, play a crucial role. So identifying the correct energy scale really plays a crucial role in this problem. Summarizing. So uh, we verify the prediction of Bogoliubo for this system of interacting boson, despite the fact that uh, these predictions were based on approximations that are not verified in this gross pitayeski regime. For example, we don't have this Born series for the scattering equation, or we cannot throw out the cubic and quartic term that Bogolyubov threw out in his reasoning. And we recover the independence of all qu physical quantities on the, on the scattering length, so the dependence only on the scattering length, so independence on the detail of the interaction. Uh, and the idea of the techniques of the proof is only based on using clever unitary operators that allow on one hand to focus on particle on the condensate and on the other hand to model correlation among particle and condensate. So to, yeah. Um, and the inclusion of this correlation leads to a renormalization of the potential. So we, we renormalize the very singular interactive potential or slowly decaying, if we see it in Fourier space, with an effective potential which decays on moment of order one and uh, whose integral is in fact related to the scattering length of V. And uh, I do not have time to comment very much on this, but with the same ideas you really obtain a norm approximation for the eigenvectors. And so you can really go further what I told you, not only compute all observables, the depletion of the condense and whatever observable you want, pressure, but also study now uh, fluctuations, central limit theory, large deviation of uh, um, your, yeah, happening on your ground state, of observable measured on your ground state. So you measure an observable on your ground state, you, you, me you, you, you know that uh, in the limit it's given by the expectation of the same observable on the both ions and condensate, but now you can really evaluate how these two measures fluctuate one respect to the other. Um, so it's really, this gives a really a good control on what is happening in your, uh, um, in your low energy eigenstate for this system. And uh, very, very sketchy, I wanted just to tell you something more. So the method I very quickly present you uh, have the nice uh, aspect that they are also very flexible to, uh, to be adapted to other problems. In particular, uh, Bose-Einstein condensation as any other phenomenon related to symmetry breaking uh, very much depend on dimension of the system. And in particular, in general, extending the result to other dimensions might be not trivial. So with the same kind of technique, but just adapted to the two-dimensional case, we, will also, we were also able to prove uh, um, analogous result for the two-dimensional gross pitayeski regime, which is now characterized by this other scaling. And the reason for the exponential is just come from the fact that the scattering length in two dimensions goes as a logarithmic. So this is why the scaling is, th is defined like that. But the idea is once more to find the scaling where the effective parameter goes as one over n, integral vf goes as one over n. So also in two dimensions you can prove some uh, 
bounds on the number of particles outside the condensate, almost optimal, not really optimal. In fact, two dimension is much harder. And uh, um, you can verify the prediction of Bogolyubov theory for this system. And you see that the, here the two dimensional case is even different, right? So that the scattering length does not appear here in this Bogolyubov sum, neither in the spectrum of excitation. This has come from the fact that two dimension is really um, different. And I want really to quote a previous result where a lady obtained it by Lips, Eiringer, and Inveson for the lead and leading order term. Um, and that uh, very few is known so far for Bogolyubov theory in two dimensions. So this was in fact the first result because the other available result was also, was only obtained by restricting to a special class of state. Okay, but this was a result for a much more difficult thermodynamic limit. While here we only deal with this group, Spitajewski. And finally, since Mathieu yesterday spoke about the thermodynamic limit, that of course it's the more challenging one, let me also add some recent improvement of this technique to be adapted to the thermodynamic limit. And just what I mean with thermodynamic limit, well, we now have n bosons in a box of size L. So this is the Hamiltonian. Now the potential is not scaled. It's really the fundamental interaction. We are not taking any scaling limit. And we are considering the regime where number of particles and the volume is sent to infinity with the density kept fixed. And in this case, uh, very few is known. So the occurrence of condensation is really a main challenge open problem. It's related to the fact that symmetry breaking in of continuous symmetry is really very complicated and challenging problem. We have, in fact, a single model where we can prove bosons and condensation in the thermodynamic limit. This is hardcore bosons at all filling. And then we have renormalization group results, but th that are not conclusive. Are only, yeah, the problem is that for boson, you have too many graph, this n factorial bounds that, uh, no, we didn't, mm, see with the Manfred, but are related to, so the problem improving both science and condensation thermodynamic limit is related to the prolification of diagrams that you don't know how to, how to control. Um, so occurrence of condensation is really a challenging problem. But the nice fact is that you are only interested to ground set energy. You don't really need that condensation is proven to in the wool uh, box going to infinity. You, it is sufficient to show condensation of smaller boxes, let's say. So a local version of condensation, this is sufficient to get the result uh, that you are interested in if you are only interested to thermodynamic function. Um, still, it's not so trivial. So you see that there is a long story, a long time passing from the very first result of the ground state energy uh, in the thermodynamic limit. These are the result leading order and only very recently the second order lower bound has been obtained. And of course, the, the excitation spectrum is still far to, to be understood. But as for the ground state energy is concerned, and in general thermodynamic function, it's very interesting that one can use some of the ideas that uh, have been developed in this gross pitayeski regime. And let me show how and why. So let me emphasize that we can now write some uh, scaling limits that interpolates between the gross pitayeski regime that we have seen so far, that was with kappa equal to zero, and the thermodynamic limit that correspond to kappa equal to two-thirds. Let me convince you that this is in fact the case. So take in fact our system. So we have a box size one, and now this scaling regime corresponds to range of the interaction of size n minus one plus k, so larger. Now we scale variables just to have an interaction of order one as the one you would consider in the thermodynamic limit. Then, of course, the size of the box has become n1 minus k. If you now copy the density, well, the density is n3k minus 2. So you see that taking kappa 2 thirds here, you get, in fact, that the density is constant, which is, in fact, the thermodynamic limit. So now you say, why do you want to write the thermodynamic limit in such a complicated formula? Well, because I want to use the fact that maybe to derive something in the thermodynamic limit, I do not really need to work with it kappa two thirds. Maybe I can use some result 
in between the GP scaling and the thermodynamic limit. And this is possible thanks to some very nice localization technique. I'm not able now to give all the details, but the idea is that some localization results allow to find lower or upper bounds for the ground state energy in the big box in this thermodynamic limit, just focusing on what happens in a smaller box of size L. A smaller box uh, where now you look at this kind of Hamiltonian with kappa that depends uh, on the if you are whether you are considering a lower bound or an upper bound. And in fact, one found that uh, for a lower bound, it's sufficient to look or to be able to control some Hamiltonian, which is slightly more less, um, yeah, uh, with, a with a range which is a uh, bit larger than the gross Pitayevsky scaling. So just kappa larger than one is uh, sufficient. But then for a lower bound to get this localization, you need to modify the kinetic energy a bit, and this uh, introduces a lot of complications. And for the upper bound, you need kappa larger than one half. That is a bit challenging. So extending the result to kappa to my, uh, one half larger than one half requires our work, but still is much easier than the thermodynamic limit itself. So it was very nice that the technique developed initially for the gross Pitayevsky regime have now proven or are being proven to be successfully also in other scaling. And I'm really finished. Uh, just a few conclusions uh, uh, to convince students that uh, many other things need to be done. So it, this is not at all the end of the story. Maybe it's the beginning in the sense that uh, OK, here there is, uh, there is just a list of first, very first question that comes to mind, just starting from this result. Let me stress that all our results only are valid for V in L3. This comes from really the way our technique are implemented, solution of the scattering equation. It would be very more interesting to, very much interesting to understand how our core interaction can be treated. Let me stress that very recently, a lower bound, a second order lower bound, to the ground state energy of uh, bosons in the thermodynamic limit was obtained for the core interaction, this paper here, but the upper bound is still an open problem. Then can we extend this result to finite temperature? We have here Andreas, which is an expert on, on this, and well, this is certainly a nice question. Then from the dynamics perfected, I didn't have time to explain at all the dynamics, but there uh, really uh, is known that the gross pitayevsky equation provide a good description for the dynamics of bosons and condensates, but less, much less is known from the fluctuation, point of view of the fluctuation. In fact, the only available result is a much simpler case of a Lorentz gas, quantum Lorentz gas con with gross pitayevsky interaction. And just dreaming, maybe starting from this, we can develop a multi-scale approach that very much in the spirit of renormalization group can give some idea to, to treat the more challenging problem of post and condensation. And thanks a lot. Thanks very much for the nice talk. Further questions, comments? Yes. Um, so, in, in your results about two dimensions uh, in the gross Pitayevsky, can you can you say a little bit about how this would be related to long range order? Uh, very, very, very good question, Manfred. In fact, the reason why I would be very interested to to understand what happens at positive temperature is really goes in that direction, because. Um, in fact, the only available result in two dimension is uh, also a positive temperature, this one, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but they, they cannot see there the costerly starless transition. And I suspect the reason is that uh, here they, they restrict to quasi-free states, so only this Bogolyubov transformation, and maybe this is why they, they lose something. So I cannot tell much there, because it, it's only a zero temperature result, so we have like bosons and condensation and long range order. But of course, the very nice question would be understanding if we can provide at least a simplified case where a two dimensional model of interacting boson where we do not have condensation, but we have uh, polynomial decay of correlation. That would be 
Exactly. So let's say this is really my motivation for starting the two-dimensional <laughs> investigation. Yes. Uh, maybe a remark concerning that. Thank um, you. So, um, I mean, if you look at experiments with the 2D Bose gases, um, you see that you actually have condensation, I mean, finite size condensation also in 2D, and you have it, but you have it at the size of the DKT critical temperature. So, I mean, the point is the length scale of the decay is just too long to see it on the small boxes. And this, since GP is a really good approximation for the experiments, I guess you would expect that, that you can still go. not catch her. Uh, no, 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 you, you can. I mean, oh, you can. Means, I, I mean, you can, but you see it as both Einstein. Yeah, yeah, no, then maybe one has to go to. to so you see, now you, we have really a technique to, to go beyond GP towards the thermodynamic limit. So maybe if you cannot see in the both signs in the GP regime, that's very convincing what you told me. Maybe one there is some hope to see it in some of these other regime. Let's see the analogous of this uh, kappa regime for the 2D case would be different, but these analogous, which are still less challenging than the thermodynamic limit, but maybe already you can see something. So this is the second hope. So if the gross pitayeski regime is not enough, maybe one can still find the scaling limit, which is not as challenging as the thermodynamic one, but uh, still relevant for seeing this difference. Yeah. But yeah, no, no, sure. it's only <laughs> hope at the moment. <laughs> yeah, thank you. More questions? Yes, these two-dimensional uh, uh, considerations, uh, this is all for, uh, for temperature zero. This is only for temperature yeah, zero, yes. Jacob, yes. Of course, positive temperature, you have <coughs> many Wagner and... Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just for the audience, in fact, for... Uh, um, Two-dimensional so two dimension is really critical for the existence of bosons and condensation. Namely, there is no condensation at any positive temperature in two-dimensional in the thermodynamic limit. This is just ruled out by a very general theorem, which is known as Mervyn-Wagner theorem. So what you can hope is not proving condensation, so there you know it does not occur, but still you can hope that uh, the um, the off-diagonal part of the one particle density matrix that when there is condensation is constant, this is an expression what is called this long range order, maybe it's not constant, but the case has a power law. So in general, where there, are no, where there is no condensation, where there is no phase transition, let's say, where you have a very high temperature, this correlation decays exponentially fast in the distance. So I hope, Jacob, my hope was that you could see uh, a power law decay for the 2D. But in, in fact, you are the, spert, the expert of positive temperature. Maybe I'm, I'm too naive in expecting I that we can prove. I just wanted to add a remark. This is uh, actually probably uh, well known to, to, to many of you. It is, uh, the question is about this definition of the concept of Ossian Einstein condensation. Namely, in, uh, for, for, for the ideal gas, for the idea of gas, without interaction. You can't have uh, condensation at positive temperature in two dimensions in a generalized sense, where the occupation, so to say, of the ground state is, is not uh, proportional to, to n, but proportional to, to n divided by log n, which is for practical purposes, of course, <laughs> almost the same. And, and this is uh, sort of part of an extremely general research for, uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, ideal gases, at least, uh, that uh, it depends on the, on the definition of, of uh, sort of what you mean, so <coughs> how you let your, uh, let your, your, uh, your parameters, uh, you, well, you can, in fact, translate this into simply a, a result where you have condensation in the sense of, uh, of uh, occupation proportional to n, but you don't take the usual thermodynamic limit, you take a slightly different limit. So the, the lesson is that you have to say always clearly how, what are you exactly talking about. Uh, this, for instance, there is a paper uh, from the uh, very early days of this uh, business 
by uh, Ketterle and Druten, where they emphasize this, uh, uh, this that um, uh, they, they draw sort of curves that look exactly like, uh, okay. uh, for, uh, like what you would expect for, for, uh, for the two dimensions. So in a, in a harmonic track, for instance, you have, uh, you don't have a conventional compensation in one dimension, but you have it in this generalized sense in, in the, also in one dimension in the harmonic uh, track, but you don't really see it uh, any, any difference if you look at the numerical. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I agree with you. I agree with you that from an experimental point of view, probably the thermodynamic limit is not needed because in other settings you still see the same. It's just maybe one is thrilled by the fact of uh, proving a result which uh, tells something about uh, face, uh, like symmetry breaking, right? And then in this case, you really yes pursue in, in trying to understand the thermodynamic limit. But thanks for the remark. You're right. Maybe. The other setting for practical purposes uh, should be really, I've never seriously looked at that, so Sam, thanks for, uh, for uh, the remark. Yeah. Uh, about the, the KT condition, so um, um, there is the BKT, the Ah, so, yeah. So there is this theorem uh, by Polish and Spencer for the classical spin uh, system. And in that case, the transition is due to a change of behavior of, of vortices in the system. And I was just wondering, are there mm -hmm. vortices or where are the vortices? In ah, very good point. Uh, so the vortices are in this. Uh, so uh, if you study the dynamics, for example, so if you create a condensate in the trap, and then uh, you remove the trap and see how the condensate evolves, then it evolves according to this gross pitayesk equation, so cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And there you can see vortices, in fact. You, you but I think we are very far really to understand really the behavior of the vortices in this quantum system. So as far as I, I, I know, so you can, um, Let's say from a statical point of view, so okay, you can, you, there are several results. Uh, Jacob is a co author of several of them, where, and also Nicola here. When you put this post Einstein condensate maybe in a trap, you make the trap rotating and vortices appear. And according to the regime, you can have more, um, few vortices, uh, giant vortices, vortices on a lattice, so you have a nice pattern. Uh, other result in the PD community also study the dynamics of these vortices uh, in a paper which are very analogous to the classical one uh, where also Mario was involved. Uh, but then they uh, can only study the dynamics until vortices are not uh, colliding, let's say. So for a time which is not. So still you cannot see collision among the vortices, so neither in the two dimensional case, the simpler, because in the three with the filaments is even. It's a, yeah, it's complete. So maybe I related. It would be amazing to understand something, but I think we are quite far also from that point of view to. to so sorry, I, I say we are still far to understand it, the vortices themselves, how they behave, or which is their dynamics. Maybe we know how they appear, but now not how they evolve. So putting the connection with this seems quite far, but of course of great interest. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe in this is uh, just a historic remark. Uh, the gross pitayevsky equation was put forward in 1961, uh, in fact, independently by uh, a Gross and uh, by uh, Pitayevsky. And uh, the title, if I remember, of this paper is uh, uh, Vortices in uh, Liquid Helium. So that's mm -hmm. what uh, they were what was aiming at at that time. And it was only then uh, after the experiments uh, mid nineties that uh, Chris Pethick and Gordon Bain, they suggested to use uh, the gross pdsd equation for describing these uh, dilute gases in, in traps. So they sort of say took the same equation, but uh, completely different parameters from the original purpose, which was liquid helium and vortices. This is just a historic remark. Thank you. I didn't know if that. Thanks a lot. Okay, if there are no <coughs> questions anymore, uh, we can thank Serena.